Okay, so George, please uh, tell us a little bit of uh, your backstory. Okay, uh, my backstory is that I have worked in the music business my pretty much my entire life from teenagehood. I started, you know, I worked retail when I was young and I played music in bars for drunks. Like I still do now, interestingly enough, that hasn't seemed to change very much. Or I used to up until COVID. Um, I, so I learned a job, you know, by the time I was out of high school, I could job like everybody else. Um, and then I spent some root, rootless years of hippie times, hitchhiking around, traveling. And then I went to agricultural college where I studied agricultural chemistry. And then immediately as soon as I graduated, went right back into music and I played the rock and roll and landed in a punk rock group and played in New York. And I went to work on 48th Street, which was back in the day was all guitar stores and gear. And I worked retail music in Times Square and started doing studio stuff in Times Square. And I spent the next decade of my life working um, various studio gigs. And I worked, I had a studio at 1650 Broadway in New York. If any of you know New York music business, there are basically two old school music buildings, 1619, which is the Brill Building, which people hear about, and 1619, which is where the Winter Garden Theater is. And there, uh, while I was doing that, I went back to school again, and I got a degree in the finance of speculative markets, which included a lot of study of econometrics and other higher math forms. Not particularly uh, exciting, but I like math. What can I say? I like science. That's why I study chemistry. But I was still working, doing what now I call my thing. Um, 1650 Broadway and an attorney. If any of you read the two-page letter that I sent out in advance of our getting together, uh, a lawyer, Bill Krasilovsky, the old men in the elevator and Mr. Krasilovsky were my mentors in the music business. So I learned the old men in the elevator were people like Phil Medley. I don't know if any of you know who Phil was. He wrote this little song called Twist and Shout you might have heard of. Um, that was my work day every day for years and years. I would go to work with the most famous people in the music business every day of my life, double shift. So I would work in the studio with maybe Ernie Isley in the day. And then I would go to my studio job at night and there, for example, I would do things like, uh, work with bands like public image or Bob Dylan, or, uh, one day I went and there was this young, young singer. She showed up. She was there before any other musician. She said, I'm the singer, I'm here, you know. And I said, well, let's come in the room. I'll get a vocal sound. And I put up the mic and she started to sing and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. And that was the, you know, barely 18 year old Whitney Houston. Um, so, you know, I just came up in music business and I learned how to manage my work as a composer and stuff was ending up in, film and TV, we were doing lots of very boring, you know, industrial film music and advertising music and demos and songwriter stuff. But a lot of it was just, you know, commercial music. But in the course of doing that, I learned about the music business. I moved to Texas in 91. Um, and I found like everywhere else, you know, as a musician, if you I had family by then that you needed a money hustle. So my money hustle was to do copyright work and general music licensing. The general music licensing turned into copyright administration. And then after you know a couple of decades of it running other people's publishing catalogs, um, that sort of blossomed into doing work now, what I call broad rights administration, because there's many classes of rights that get uh, created in the course of creating music and performance. And so now um, in my day job life, when I'm doing my thing, I do, just pure music business, the same kind that lawyers and accountants do in the music business, but I do it from a musician's perspective or a producer's perspective. I've written lots of music and still continue to write lots of music. I found a long time ago that, uh, you know, getting an on-camera vocal cut in a TV show paid my mortgage for six months and I didn't have to go work $50 honky-tonk jobs so much. And so, you know, I have a life both as a musician now and, and as a music business person. And I do music business all over the world um, as a publisher or publisher's agent. And so I have contacts, mostly in publishing, but in the record business too. And as I said, in these broader rights, there are collective administrative organizations all over the world that collect and administrator, administer all kinds of rights, not just performance rights for musicians, but sound recording rights, rights for authors, all these collective administrative pipelines are what make up 
the royalty streams that keep people alive. So all of you as you know, musicians or managers have to be aware of the potentialities of that. And when you do your music business, you know, keep in mind the management of the assets. And that was where Bo's, let me go, I can segue into Bo's questions now, which if I get up in front of me, uh, we're about, oh, so I'm so unprepared. Pardon, my Zoom lifestyle is not so together as other people's. Um, but does that answer, you know, is that a good enough rendition of how I got to be here? Does that make sense? To... Bo, are you there? I don't hear you. Are you speaking? Okay. Oh, got me. I got you now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just give us an idea of the, the many aspects of the music industry you're currently involved in. Oh boy. Well, the broad rights thing, I, I, you know, I do a lot of work with PROs like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC all over the world. Then there's, you know, neighboring rights, which are the rights of your sound recordings and your performances on them. Um, I've done a little bit in secondary rights, which is cable rebroadcast. That's hard to break into, um, but very lucrative. Um, but mostly it's just involved, you know, a lot of what I've done for the last 30 years is pretty pure music publishing. I go in and out of the record business it's, as it suits me. It's at times, you know, it's generally a crappy deal for artists to be in the record business, as it were. So um, you have to you know, go in and out of it as it suits you. Yoking under a record deal is sometimes really bad, you know, for artists. I've worked, uh, I used to do royalties. I can't name the label, but one of the labels I used to do royalties for, um, they, you know, had negative royalty rates because of the way the contracts were written, stuff like that. So, but nicely what I do now is pure. I have a couple catalogs I run and um, one of them is like a great part-time job. It's a big catalog that makes money. And, you know, I still do play a lot of jobs where I was up until now. Very unglamorous, you know, playing in bars, just like the rest of y'all. It's just, I've, uh, I, I've worked at my money hustle for a long time. Every musician needs a money hustle. And that's been my money hustle all these years to, you know, get filmmakers. They need someone to supervise their documentary. Well, I can do that. You know, a uh, ad company needs a song for an advertisement. I can get you the rights. And you do that for a long time, of course, you get yourself in the infrastructure of the music business, which is, you know, over a decade or two, you really, you get to know some Indians and some of the chiefs, I guess. So you can do business. And it depends where in the food chain something is, where I do in the dialogue, you know, um, I have a lot of clients that, you know, musician clients who somebody wants to put something in a movie. So I'll do the negotiation and make a nice license for them and look after their interests. It's really easy to um, be confused in those settings uh, as a musician or as an artist who's inexperienced with the rights. Let me just review. Did everybody, did anybody look at the two page letter that I sent in advance of our getting together today? I don't know, show of hands or anything. Um, okay, well, one, I can't, some people have their cameras off, so I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on back there. Um, <clears throat> as a musician, when you create a song with somebody, I'm just going to walk you through this process in a nutshell, and I'm going to go pretty quick. So if you have questions, just write them down, and hopefully I'll get to them. You know, you get together with your friend, you write a song, boom. You've created a copyright. It has what's called the common law right of copyright embodied in it right at that moment. And then you have to get with your friend. Oh, can I back up one other thing? Bo, will you send everybody today the link to Wixon's Music 101? Sure thing, yeah. Um, one of my colleagues who I think the world of, he's one of my gurus, he's a very substantial guy in the music business who even people way up in the business have no idea who he is. His name is Randall Wixon, he runs Wixon Music. Randall has these little acts that you might have heard of, like The Doors or Kenny G or Jackson Brown or uh, Neil Young or Tom Petty's Estate. Uh, Randall is, for my money, the best publishing administrator on God's green earth and a guru to me. And his music publishing 101, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is really well covered in that uh, on those web links. And everything I'm going to touch on is much more thoroughly covered in that in that link it's spectacular 
And I urge you all to read it and understand it. The other book I urge you all to get, if you're going to be a professional in the music business, is This Business of Music by William S. Krasilovsky, my other great mentor. And the real textbook, it's much better than the Donald Passman book because it's written like a textbook. So when somebody says to you, oh, I can use your song in my political campaign for a county commissioner because it's fair use, you're going to be able to look up fair use. And Kras was one of the most eminent uh, music publishing attorneys in the world. He did little things like get Chuck Berry back his copyrights. So he know he knew lots of stuff and um, was although not the most patient <laughs> teacher. Um, so all right, so you create this copyright, and then you have to decide if you know how you're going to split it up. You really have to have that conversation. Don't be shy about it. Just say. Like I wrote all the words, you wrote all the music. That makes me the author, you're the composer. So we split the copyright 50-50. Or maybe you just showed up at your friend's house and you gave him a great line, the hook. And that's all you did. Well, it might, you might talk about it and you decide, well, let me just, he said, it's the hook. I want you to have 25% of the song. I have a friend I write with who's a fairly well-known uh, Americana artist. And whenever we write a song together, it's just 50-50. Even if I give him two lines, he just gives me half the song. That's his philosophy on it. So, but have that discussion. Let's, and let's say you work that out amongst yourselves. And so then you, the most important thing to do in this environment, I want to tell you all right now that the copyright law has changed. Um, the new uh, copyright law, one of the important changes for songwriters is that you cannot begin an act the, the common law right of copyright is distinct from the copyright capital C that is given to you by the Library of Congress when you make a filing. It is the single most important thing you can do as a creator to indenture your claim on your creations in the United States. That means if you make a recording, you should file a sound recording copyright in that recording. If you write a bunch of songs, you should file a performing arts copyright in your works. Because what's changed in the law is that you cannot bring an action for infringement without a valid claim already in existence. It used to be you could file the claim and then file the lawsuit. You can't do that anymore. You have to have the fully perfected copyright. That's a big deal because the statute gives you power in the law if you have that full capital C copyright that doesn't exist in common law copyright. The most important of which is the right to collect lawyers fees and the most important statutory damages that are written into the law. The reason I have been able to get over on large networks like when I've been infringed is because I can go to that large network and say, here's my copyright. You are broadcasting that. The guy who made that movie never paid me. So you are taking a willful violation of my right to this copyright, and you have to take it off the air or see to it that I get paid. Because the statutory penalty for a synchronized use is $125,000 per infringement. So say you filed a sound recording copyright and you filed a performing arts copyrighted, they're on the hook potentially for $250,000 $250, in statutory penalties plus your lawyer's fees. That, that will get a corporate lawyer off his ass and deal with you, even though he's never heard of you. But you got to show up at the party with the right, you know, the right docs and the right attitude. So that's, those are important things to be aware of, especially if any of you plan on getting older and dying and you might have children along the way or loved ones you care about. And maybe you are lucky enough in your life to have a copyright that actually makes money. You know, and all of a sudden you have a little catalog of songs, you have some covers, you got a couple of movie cuts, you might have a few things going on. All of a sudden you're making three, five, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars a year as a writer and a publisher in one basket. And you know that's gonna go on for 10 or 15 years, but you got cancer and you got an ex-wife, you got three kids and a current wife. Well, you don't want people, you know, uh, James Brown's estate is still not closed. B.B. King's estate is a mess. He has like 26 kids. Screamin' Jay Hawkins has like 68 documented children. So it's nice when you die to have all that stuff nicely tied up in your estate. So, you know, you have a will, you have a durable power of attorney, you have a health proxy and a living will, all things that all of us should have as adults. But if you in that will have perfected copyrights, you can 
control the disposition of them. So maybe you don't want your miserable ex-wife to have a claim on that. You want to have all the money go to your one child who needs it for college. You can make that dictate and it can, you can perfect your estate and get out of probate with those things in order. So I, I consider them to be important. Letters of direction to the performing rights organization already may be in your estate plan so that you know when you die, BMI is going to pay your writer's money to that kid and not your miserable ex-wife. Those are the kind of things I'm talking about. Um, and they're important. They're really important. I've worked on so many estates and divorces where you have to parse all that out. And they end up paying me a lot more because it takes me longer. You know, you, sometimes you have to conduct an audit or two or three because there might be, like I had a client who was getting to, his, well, his wife hired me, a very successful Texas songwriter you've never heard of. But one of those guys who can play in Texas for the rest of his life and work as a co-writer in Nashville till he's dead because he's had hits. And, you know, we had to parse out every song and figure out what it was and get the right letters of direction going. And, you know, it cost her some money, but the divorce settled very clearly and easily because everything was beautifully delineated. And every, all the parties, it was all parsed out right at the beginning. So the decree was very easy to close and, and do the closing. And these are real world things that hang people up, you know, and if you need the money or your kid needs the money or your wife needs the money, it's nice to know those things are attended to. By the way, I got to say in the context of this conversation, I'm not an attorney. I don't practice law. I practice music business. So what I'm about is custom of the trade and what I feel is appropriate on behalf of my clients or my colleagues. And so, uh, you know, with respect to law and how things actually operate in the law, I, I can tell you from my experience what I've experienced, but not what it's not, I'm not allowed to interpret the law on your behalf and I'm not allowed to, uh, well, it gets into this whole thing. I have to just, at times I've had to be very careful about not practicing law. I'm sorry. So we've covered some of those things. Copyright, the invention of copyright. Um, let's talk about what you need as songwriters. All of you should be affiliated. If you're a professional songwriter and derive, you know, at least 30% of your income as a performing working musician. You know, if it's not just the occasional monthly gig, but if you're making a living from your music, you need to be affiliated with a performing rights organization. I'm assuming everybody's here in America, and I'm just going to talk about U.S. custom and practice, because in different parts of the world, I would tell you different things. In America, your, your, your rights are limited. Believe it or not, this is not the home of the free when it comes to artists' rights. We have in America, we don't have what are called moral rights, which is a whole class of rights everywhere else in the world are res respected. In America, very often as the part of deals like work for hire, any kind of work for hire work you might do, you're often asked to uh, write away your moral rights, which is a terrible thing. I can't go into that lecture about why moral rights are important, but you don't have them here. So, and try not to sign them away. If you see them in an agreement, you know, that they want your moral rights, just say, no, I'm not going to do it. And if you can get over without doing it, don't. But um, but you want to join a PRO, ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. If you had to ask me which one right now, I'd say you should join BMI. If you're a professional and serious about your career, then create a publisher affiliation as well. Um, because there's two separate things. That way later you might be able to sell your catalog or mortgage your catalog of recordings, but not touch your sound recordings. There's, there's a lot of ways to manage the assets. So like, I think it's worth, if you're a professional, don't do the, ah, oh, hold on, let me that go away. I'm sorry. Um, the, I'm going so fast here, I have to think for a moment, pardon me. You want to have some affiliation, join BMI, it's fine. Be a publisher, be a writer, cost, I don't know what the publisher affiliation costs, 200 bucks, something. It's worth it. Make sure that when you perform, uh, sorry. Uh, when you perform, you index your works with the PRO. It doesn't happen by itself. Giving your, telling BMI what your songs are and where you're playing them is important. You can send them your gigs. They have a way that BMI Live allows you to register your gigs, so you might get a little performance income. Certainly, if you're playing bigger venues, you know, where they sell tickets, you really want to register those performances. And over time in America, finally... You know, for years, I, when I used to play, I used to play in Europe more than the States, and I would get a little performing money every year 
from my sub publishers for the gigs I played in Holland and Belgium because I was playing, performing my songs in those territories and I had records out and they would send me my money. It's only in the last few years in America that ASCAP and BMI are catching up. But join a PRO regardless, make a relationship with somebody at the society, have a rep. I am a relationship person. I still think at its heart, the music business is a people business. So I'll do all the stuff online they want you to do. It's all very nice, but get a guy. You know, when I have an issue at the copyright office, I have a guy there. I call him up. When I have an issue at BMI, I got a, several people there to call up. It's really important to build those relationships professionally. I believe in that. You know, I really do. And you find out who's worthy, you know, who is worthy of your time and attention and who's a time waster. Maybe if you spent more than 10 minutes in show business, you might have found out there's a time waster or two and the time vampires are brutal. So you've joined your PRO, you've split up your song with your colleague, you have your copyright. Now you're going to make your recording. Now, with respect to making your recordings, listen, I'm going to assume all of you don't have record deals and you're not laboring under some record contract. You're just going to make a record and you want to put your record out. Maybe you notice there's a glut of product. I do not believe in whoring out the music. I do not believe going to DistroKid or TuneCore or CD Baby and letting them whore your music out for you is a per personally, I don't think it's a good strategy. We live in an age of perfectly vertical integration, which is the distance between you and your consumer. You will make more money per unit, per download, per record sales. If you sell it directly to you as an artist, to your fans, it is still, I believe in this current environment, in these COVID times, the most successful models. One of my kids is an artist. He's a glass artist. And it's sort of like being in a restaurant. He goes to work every day. He makes a beautiful thing. He puts it up on Instagram like a nice dinner or wherever he has his pipeline for his sales. And a lot of work and money he's making now, he's making selling directly to the ultimate user um, as opposed to his wholesale distributors, which he has a whole nest of. So I encourage you all to think in those terms. The, the current period we're in because of the inter internet being so beautiful, you don't need a record label. Um, or, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm a big fan of, of the sort of retail off the shelf distribution channels. I personally prefer TuneCore. Uh, it makes harvesting the data easier if you have people you have to pay and you have to do any kind of royalty accounting, but they only take a fee, not a percentage. You know, the worst thing to happen in your business is like to put up a record on CD Baby and all of a sudden, you know, you make 50 grand and you got to give five of it to them instead of the $50 you could give TuneCore to post your record. You know, if any of you want to use their administrative services for either of those companies, I can't comment how good or bad they are. I don't use them. I noticed that, uh, was it TuneCore or CD Baby? I think CD Baby now has a copyright filing service, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. I don't know if they do a good job of perfecting the claim in a way that's most correct, but it's another option. There's off the shelf uh, copyright administrative services like SongTrust, you know, they take a fairly big cut, but um, it's maybe not a bad thing if you have nothing else and you need those services. There are people like me that are vestigial of the music business that still are sort of, you know, run small music businesses. And then, you know, you always have to worry about your fish pond ratio in these settings. So if you're not a tiny little fish. You know, you might think, oh, it's great. BMG is going to sign me, but BMG is a giant company and they could forget about you real quick. So, all right, is that enough? Have I helped forth sufficiently? What else? I think we can uh, go move to questions right now. Um, okay. Jeff has a question. George, can you briefly explain what moral rights are? Uh, okay, in Germany, for example, you can't sell your writer's share of a copyright because it's part of your legacy and the government demands that you protect that for, because the copyright survives you, they demand that you cannot sell it. You can mortgage it under certain circumstances because you're heirs, that's money for your heirs. So the moral right that's invested prevents you from doing something stupid that will uh, rob your, your heirs or your estate from income. So very often, for example, with respect to neighboring rights, you say you're hiring me to, to, to make a soundtrack for your movie and you want it as a work for hire and instead of giving me a piece of the publishing, okay, but you're paying me, I don't know, $150,000 for your $40 million movie to write the score, it's okay. And you want it as a work for hire. When I get your agreement, it's gonna ask me to sign my moral rights. What it doesn't say as a part of that is that even though I play all over the soundtrack and I'm the principal performer, 
as part of the work for hire, unless I carve it out for myself, my neighboring right as a performer is taken from me under the guise of that moral right. And so the, in America, we refuse to sign on and respect artists' moral rights. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Okay. What else? Why BMI over ASCAP? Is that the next one in the queue? Yeah. Am I doing that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm learning. My yeah, Zoom chops well. are getting better. Why BMI over ASCAP? Ah, it's just a personal prejudice. You can get good service out of ASCAP. I'm not so sure about CSAC. I only have one friend who's a CSAC writer that lets me look. Oh, actually, I have two CSAC writer clients now that I think about it. It's okay. You have to be invited to join CSAC. I don't think they're given advances anymore. Used to be in the old days, the PROs would give you advances. I once got a really lot of money. Who was one, I have a friend who's one of the early composers of music for... Uh, interactive video and to sign him BMI gave him money. They gave him a nice advance. They don't do that anymore. I like BMI. I like the website better. I get more phone calls returned from people from BMI, but I have a good connection there. I have an old colleague who I've known since I've been in the business. So, uh, so mainly it's just a personal preference. I, I was asking cause I've, I've been with ASCAP for 20 years. I didn't know if you thought it was worth, if you can make it work for you, beautiful, yeah. make it work. You know, I have nothing against ASCAP. I, um, I've had good and bad relations. You know, I've been doing this so long, you sort of cycle through so many people. So I've had good, I was an ASCAP writer for years when I started. And then I had a bunch of performances that they gave me all kinds of reasons that they weren't gonna pay me on. I had a movie come out and I had all oh, this TV. They kept using my music and like everything. And, and they never, oh, it wasn't on our survey. That was back in the days when there was surveys as opposed to censuses. Now with the modern metadata, oh, metadata. Let's come back to that in a minute. But in the modern uh, era, you know, that they can't screw you out of that stuff as easy as they used to. If you have a good ASCAP rep, is it in Nashville or uh, LA or New York? Oh, can you turn Jeff, turn your mic? I, I've had more contact with the people in Nashville just because it's closer. Um, okay. There is actually a guy that's an ASCAP rep here in Kansas City. Those are usually for licensing though, not for artists. Yeah, yeah. Is your work, where does your work appear? Um, well, right now I'm still just submitting stuff. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've been, you know, I've been making records and rock bands this whole time and like yeah. it's not really appeared anywhere except for on our CDs, but um, just in the, within the last year or so, I've been submitting for TV and film placement and just- Good. do it yourself. Don't, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, so I'm just registering all those titles. Okay, I'm not I, a I, fan, keep your registrations up. I'm not a fan of those library deals. I think they're very exploitive. So do your submissions on your own and don't sign one of those give away the copyright deals. I think they're wrong ethically. I think it's bad ethics for the music business to get over on that. And uh, I don't know how much time you spent in Nashville, but there's some horrific shit. Yeah, I, I, I did just sign 11 tunes with a, a, a place called Sync Shop and it's not, it's real, it's real open-ended. I mean, it's non-exclusive and it doesn't, I'm not giving away any of the rights or anything like that. But. Yeah, but if they get you a cover, do they get to keep the copyright? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Go back and look at your deal. Okay. And see, okay. a lot of times those deals are open ended and great until they get get you something, which could be some poorly defined thing. And yeah. then most of the time, they get they acquire ownership of the copyright by just placing it. it My feeling from good. reading it all was that that that's not the case, but I, I will go back and look at it because maybe so. I would. You probably and know make better. Make sure you can get your copyright back. And what, the, what circumstances would engender it. And then there's, of course, rights of survivorship. We didn't talk about that. But say they get you a successful copyright and you get hit by a bus. Is your family going to be able, did you sign away the recapture? Because you're allowed to recapture in the law. There's a good example of a moral right you'll lose. In U.S. law, your estate is allowed to recapture your copyright. But if you sign a moral rights thing where you give away all the extensions, there, you know, depending on the language, it, you're not allowed to do that in other places in the world, but here you are because you're free in a sense or not, depending how you look at it. So, um, yeah, the copyright basics thing, my colleague uh, did this for all you guys. Um, this is a really good primer about how to file a copyright. It's excellent. He's a master at this now. And this, these are up to date. This is the current with the current changes. 
to the, the Library of Congress changes how they do stuff all the time. And they're preparing for a big change in that 2021, we will have a mechanical licensing collective in America, like the rest of the world. So all your mechanical rights are going to get filed through one pipeline. Wow. Which it, it's going to be a giant fuster cluck for the first couple of years, but you all got to be prepared, which brings me back to this issue of metadata. And this is really important, and I can't stress it enough, that all of us as artists and creatives, our, our work is basically being, it's the most, it's being reduced to zeros and ones. And the largesse of the pipeline where your money is going to come from is going to be a digital pipeline. So for your work to be seen, noticed, and for the money to come back to you, it's not about the data that your work is, the film data, the music data. It's about the metadata, the data about your data. So is there a header and a foot around that file? Because none of us, we mostly encode, but don't encrypt. So you encode by putting information at the beginning and the end of the file. You can do that depending what kind of authoring software you use. There are ways to do it. I don't know what people use. So I have my own means of doing that. And I do it different protocols for different outputs. But you know who the author is, who the composer is, who the publisher is. Do you have an ISRC code generator? Everybody should. You can't generate an ISWC. That has to come from your PRO. But if you have one, is that in your metadata? That's, you know, who's the performing artist? Who's the record label? Um, all that stuff needs to be in your metadata. Otherwise, you ain't going to get no money. Just making an MP3 and throwing it up on Spotify, you are fouquet. This is really important. So you really got to step up and think about how you author, what you're authoring for, what pipeline it's going into. Does that make sense? If you have encryption, you have a way to encrypt, encrypt your work. Very few of us do, but it's a beautiful thing because then for some of the modalities, you can actually get it off the broadcast medium while it's being performed and you, know, you ensure your work is stamped and encrypted into it, but it's not common. But encoding is important. Um, there is a company called, let me get the name right, that I use. One tool I use a lot is a software called Switch. Oh, no, MP3 Tagger it is. They're both made by the same company, NCH, NCH Software. They make a software suite that allows you to do all kinds of things with video and audio. But one of the things, one of the little suites is a $20 module that I love is the mp3 ID tagger because anytime I send an mp3 out to anybody for any business purpose all that information is in the mp3 a picture comes up with me or the artist or something that's encoded that knows that it came from me um, and then all that information I'm talking about is encoded there so the mp3 you can't to you know pillage that you have to turn it into analog audio and back into uh, uh, I mean there's a lot of ways to get it out of there but it's a way if you're, if you're lucky enough to have your stuff get in a cue sheet for a program, you want to add that stuff to the cue sheet so that it ends up in your performing rights. Cue sheets. Any of you have any things in videos, TV shows, movies? The cue sheet is your way to get paid. So if somebody's putting your stuff on an internet program or something, ask for a cue sheet and send a cue sheet to your PRO. More questions? Have I gone too fast and confused people? I hope not. I speak quickly without thinking too much. <laughs> I'm sorry. But there's a lot to take in in this setting, and there's a lot to learn. Um, but a lot of it is confusing enough that it doesn't matter how slow or fast you speak. That it's. You know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the two-page letter that I sent will help parse this out for you all. And the uh, copyright instructions which I just looked over cursorily because he managed to send it to me all of 10 minutes before we began today uh, because he's very busy. <laughs> it's the royalty season is closed. So now uh, at the end, you know, we, we generally administer royalties twice a year, half year periods. That's the custom of the trade in publishing generally, although that's changed a lot in the last two years, but everybody's busy getting their royalties in order. And so, but it's a beautiful guide. It looked great. And really like the next time you want to file copyright, this will walk you all through it and you don't have to pay nobody and get used to it. If you're a working songwriter and you're creating, or if you got a label or as a manager, you got artists, file those copyrights. You know, it's 65 or $85, very well spent. I can't tell you how many times I have collected 
settlements fast and easily and fairly because I have that copyright form. I'm a big, I, ever since I've been in this business, it's been a big deal for me to get my filings done. And boy, have my clients been happy. And having to defend a common law claim is problematic. I've done it enough times with and without the attorneys. And I have been an expert in many lawsuits at this point and an auditor in many cases, legal cases. And my goal always with especially starving artists is to keep you, keep you away from the lawyers if possible because that shit gets expensive in a heartbeat. And if you think what I'm talking to you about is confusing, wait till you get in the trenches with the lawyers under the operations and the law about whatever the issue is, unless it's, um, I also encourage working artists to join the American Federation of Musicians. Oh. Um, <laughs> I believe it's important to be a member of the AF of M, especially when working casuals. When I work parties like weddings and you know larger money casuals, four figure casuals, I generally do them under an AF of M contract because if the other party doesn't pay, I have a really good agreement, a time-tested agreement to drag them into court and get my money. And as a self-employed person in the music business, my whole working life is about getting the money up off the table. I can't say that enough. I don't buy into blue sky. It'll be great. It's just bullshit. What matters to me, I got three kids and a mortgage. What matters to me is, are you paying me fairly for this? And am I going to be able to get the money? So, you know, how good it's going to be is useless to me personally. You know, if you don't have kids, you, you know, you're living eight months of the year in the van, you know, it's a different lifestyle and your needs are different. But just in my life, getting paid is a big deal. Very old school about that. It's a hard business and I have been screwed. I got two real serious screwings at the same time when I was young in the business. And it was a valuable lesson about how to conduct yourself in a way and realize that nobody is looking out for you. It's a hard, bitter lesson. You have to do it yourself. And if you have people in your life that you care about and love, you have to provide for them. It's not the, you know, there will be no pie, to quote Willie Dixon, there will be no pie up in the sky when you die. You got to do it. So I encourage you all to really make the effort and do the homework. Get Kraz's book. If you're serious about your careers, then work, 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 work. Boy, I know that Bo Bledsoe. He's a hardworking man. He's a good role model. And a networker, a brutal, you know. I was so impressed when I came to Kansas City with your community and how great it was. Good on you. And they haven't screwed up Kansas City like they've screwed up Austin. They haven't been descended upon by ruthlessly, ruthless rich people. Hey, there's Havala. Where are you at? I don't see you, Havala. Chris. Ah. Am I on my screen? I mean, maximize here. Hi, George. Where are you? I'm oh, there you are. Hi, Havala. Hi. Nice to see you. Welcome. Great to see you. Yeah. Thanks for info. Yeah, more questions. Come on, give me questions. What don't you understand that I raised? What can I widen and deepen here? Could, uh, George, could we talk a little bit about uh, when you should start your own publishing? Hmm. If you want to be a professional songwriter and you're writing, you know, if you have more than two records released, if you put out, you know, say you got 40 songs, 50 songs in your catalog and people like your songs, you know, maybe you got eight, 10,000 plays on a YouTube. Um, that's a good time. You know, it's easy. You know, you know, just if you're a BMI writer, you just become a BMI affiliate publisher. Once they give you an approved name, you file a DBA, DBA, open up a savings account. Boom. You're Warner Chapel. Yeah. The PROs are making that really easy to do now on just yes. on the websites. Yeah. It's super easy. It was, then, it was pretty easy to do it on ASCAP even 20 years ago when I joined yeah. to just have publishing and writing. They want to enfranchise you. You know, that's, you are, everything comes from the songwriters, the real music business people realize that it was so interesting. I have a friend who's a big high up executive in one of the majors. And the reason he has lasted this long is because all he cares about is songwriters and music. He, I mean, he's very aware. He's a very astute businessman. You know, he oversees probably at this point, hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties, but all he wants to talk about is the writers they're signing and the great songs that they're getting and the great recordings that are being made, you know, by artists he loves. Those are the people you want to be with at every level of the business. The people that 
that still love the thing, you know? I love singing and playing. I, I, I'm going to do it my whole life. I'm not going to stop because I'm either broke or whatever. I'm, I'm going to do it. Songs pop into your head. You're a writer, right? So you just got to behave like a grown up and not get, you know, the drugs and alcohol are problematic, right? We all know this. Any of us are surviving. You know, you spend six weeks away from home, come home for three weeks, go out for another eight, spit, come home for two weeks, do that for a decade. We get tired. You, you know, you're not home, your kids, you come home all of a sudden, you know, you missed the bar mitzvah because you had to go to Australia, all that stuff. We sacrifice a lot to do what we do. Um, George, you had mentioned that you didn't like going the library route, which, which I understand. Um, yeah. What's, and I assume you're talking about the best way is just to go directly to the music supervisors. If you can get in, if you can get a listen, that was my next question. I was feel like that, that feels like a, a locked door for someone who's just starting out. Oh, it's hugely difficult. I, um, under another name, I'm listed in a supervisor's guide. And every day I get, sub, you know, the way to do it, the way to get submissions is to write in advance and ask for permission. Unsolicited material very rarely gets you in here. But if you have good manners and you write to a supervisor you like who's doing a show you like and you write in advance and say, you know, I'm Jeff Frelling and I'm a songwriter in Kansas City and I really, really enjoy your work. And, you know, may I, have a, may I send you a song, please? You know, and if they say yes, send it and you will not hear from them. And for the first hundred you do that to, you might hear from two, one of which who says, eh, get to work. One of you says, well, I like that. I can't use it, but, you know, I'll keep you in mind. And it takes years. What I was saying to you before about the years it takes to build those contacts in the industry, those are of great value, the people you know. And that's where I'm afraid a lot of that stuff comes from. You know, if I call my friend at BMG in Los Angeles, Pamela, and I need a song because I'm working on a program and I find a big hit that I, we can't afford and I call her up and say, you know, I need this, I have this sink, this is my budget, what do you got? Sometimes she'll, you know, she won't necessarily go to their library, she'll turn to a friend in LA who's a, you know, well, I can't do that out of this, but I know this guy, why don't you call him? And he's got 40 or 50 tunes, you probably parse out. You know, it's really, build the relationships. It's not gonna come from generic submissions. That's what I say. There are producers right there in Kansas City. There are people making films right where you are. Find them. Go find those people. Find your people where you are. Build, Bo is a master at this. You know, you probably could do a whole thing about score to picture and who in your region between St. Louis Kansas City and I don't know, Chicago. Jesus, so much production work in Chicago. How long does it take to drive to Chicago from where you are? Eight and <laughs> How long? Eight and a half hours. So, right. So you spend a week there, go up there for a week and book a bunch of appointments, you know, especially with people who are making industrial films that, that you scored a picture. The competition from libraries now is fierce. And the competition from the majors is fierce because there are everybody's suffering in some ways. And everybody, it used to be the majors didn't prospect among supervisors. They didn't care. They would just let one what came in through the door, coming through the door, but now they're out competing against you. It's hard. What else? Oh, come on. Bueller. <laughs> Come on, questions. Otherwise, you know, you're gonna have to put me on the clock when you got questions next time. It'll get expensive. <laughs> There's a lot of ground to cover, and I know this is confusing. Publishing confuses even experienced professionals because there's a lot of facets to it. You know, it doesn't all come, the money doesn't come from one spigot. There's 30 or 40 spigots. I, I got a question. Yes, sir. What was, uh, this question actually is for Bo. What was that, uh, it was a, it was a group that we came together. It was like, I don't know, it was like 10, 10 of us. And we learned kind of about some of this stuff. What, what was that again, Bo? The uh, Artist Inc. Artist, Artist Inc. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So here's one thing that um, I've noticed within Kansas City that I don't notice anywhere else. There's so many separate cliques and there's so many people that are all working on this sort of thing, but we're not working together at all. Like 
I mean, here we are working together. This is a fantastic start to a beautiful thing. This Heartland Song Network is the greatest thing to happen to Kansas City outside of all the other groups. But the one thing I'm wondering is, in that group, I specifically was talking about, uh, you know, uh, sync licensing for syncing for films, music, television, and stuff. And I'm sitting here hearing everybody talking about that, like Jeff Freiling, who's talking about he's been trying to do the sync licensing for the last year. So have I. Why are we not working together on this? We can make massive more money if we work together than if we're working against each other or not even against each other, but independently. I just feel like we could be so much more cohesive in what we're doing. And it, it's, it's like, I just wish that, you know, sitting here talking about Jeff Freiling, talking about sync licensing, I'm like, well, we did that group a year ago and we haven't followed up on each other. We haven't called each other on the phone. We don't email each other. We don't talk about the sync licensing. So my question to you, George, is yes. how can we bridge that gap? Well, I got ideas about that. Um, when the film industry got to be really big in Austin, a couple of people independently put together local music clearinghouses for the, and they put together collectives just to put local music. Now you could do that. You could make a, a you know, a clearinghouse web collective, of course. And then when somebody wants to use one of those songs, then you'll call me up and I'll do the deal for you. Oh, shoot. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Bob Dylan. Um, you know, so you could make a clearinghouse for Kansas City music because you have such variety there, you know, and then you could have a couple of good conjuntos that you got there and, you know, some jazz and some, some you know, maybe some American music and some blues. And yeah, you could have a, I, I would try to get the AF of M involved too. I know people don't like their unions, but I'm a union supporter. Here's especially another, in these days. I, I'm, I'm union all the way. I absolutely union like, you know, bargaining rights it's it's so huge right now that union contract is a big deal union insurance i'll tell you a true story i used to get my health insurance through the union and our middle kid had a traumatic brain injury very serious he was in intensive care for a week he was on life support and at that time the codicil in the union policy said because so many people are out on the road if you were injured as opposed to becoming ill the first 30 days of your hospitalization would be completely covered well guess what about 90,000 bucks of hospital bills were completely covered. And so I don't have health insurance wow. through the union anymore because I'm a successful musician now. My wife has a good day job, which wasn't always the case, but she does now. Um, but when I had that union health insurance, so I'm going to pay my union dues every year till I'm dead. Even though I didn't, when I should, lived in New York, I should have joined 802 because then I was doing work that would have contributed to a pension. So I'm not going to get my pension through the union, but I still get my musical instrument insurance through the union, which is really cheap. I, you know, I get it like, I don't know, $30,000 worth of insurance for 285 bucks. Wow. So such a good value. And the union health policies, while maybe not perfect, are something. You know, there's death benefit policies. There's certain things that you need as an older grown up that you don't need as a 30 year old when you're living in the van, you know. <laughs> you know, living off a pearl. Yeah, we all did that. So now that you're grownups, you got to think about this stuff. So, and you know, and if you join the AF of M, you don't have to, you can join and be a member and show up at the meetings and make shit work. You know, it's not just the orchestral musicians. They shouldn't be allowed to dominate the AF of M. I'm sure there's a lot of touring jazz players there that are members and I, you know, I, more in common. Yeah. I have one more, I have one more question. Okay. Yes. Along the lines of, you know, unions, <clears throat> there's, there's, you know, that's another group. And so there's these groups that may not communicate that may not get along. My, mm -hmm. what, what, uh, my new mission in Kansas city is, is to find a way to work with people that may not necessarily want to work with you. Like what I'm talking <laughs> about, you know, like right. say, say someone just straight up doesn't like you, but you see, the value in that relationship for the better good. How do you, how ah, do you My answer to that is because I'm often in a difficult situation like that in a negotiation, where you're trying to negotiate something difficult, come to the table with a solution. 
That's how, with an A plan and then a B plan in case your solution doesn't work. Showing up in any difficult negotiation with a solution is a strategy both to solve a problem and get more of what you want out of a negotiation. Don't leave it to the other party to show up with you know, their demands or how they think it should be. You lay out a program to solve a problem. People are more inclined to cooperate. And even if they disagree or want to amend the plan, you're already dealing with a doable framework. Okay. So that's how. Show up with a solution. Get the guy from, get the union rep, get the PRO rep in the room together, get what other, like the songwriter network, rep in the room together, get somebody from the symphony orchestra in the room, because those are working musicians. Table situation there. Yeah, get a piece of, get a pie. I'm a big believer in uh, better jazz through red beans, you know? Get a pie and a pot of coffee and sit down and talk about where you need to go, where each party needs, feels they need to go. You know, I'm sure that the orchestral musicians in town would love some love from the jazz musicians. And I'm sure that the academic the guys who teach at the universities and the high school. I'm a huge fan of, if I had to go to, I did this recently, I had to go to Indiana and hire a band for a friend's funeral. And I have a theory that was once again proven right. The best source in any given community of really good musicians, not high school, but middle school band directors. Hmm. Go to every middle school band director in the Kansas City area, because unlike high school band directors, they have more time to job. They're not so busy outside of school with marching band and all the other bullshit that band directors get stuck with. So they have time to job. So they're out in the community, you know, playing honky tonks or bar gigs or roadhouse gigs or whatever. So they're a, a really good nest, especially if you need charts or an arranger <laughs> for, you need to hire like four horns somewhere. Find a middle school band director. That's, yeah, no, I, sex in my band is so I great. feel like, yeah, I feel like I just need to ask, you know, that type of question because we do have some amazing stuff happening in Kansas City with yeah. uh, even uh, Chris Bruders and uh, Havala, you know, the yeah. here's to the roots thing that's been going for years. And then Earl Fantastic. Brick, you know, all those people, I feel like we can, we can, we can just do so much better without, and then, you know, when the rich folks come to town, we can, we can kick them out, you know, we can work together. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really, you know, and I have to say from my visits to Kansas City, you should be able to get all those people in a room someday because you have some of the best day drinking bars <laughs> that I've been to. That yes. joint with the great jukebox. I mean, come on, what's the ship doing in the afternoon? What a great place to sit around and talk about this stuff when it's quiet in the bar. There you can get a little snack too. Yeah, <laughs> I like so, that. You know, yeah, so get all those people in a room. You know, you have a lot of common ground to cover. We, one thing we have here that's been very helpful to the community is an organization called HAM, which is the Health Alliance for Austin Musicians. Um, and we have a couple of times a year, HAM Day, where we have fundraisers, all the musicians perform for free and collect money, and that all goes to HAM. So like when you need a new kidney, HAM can help you get a new kidney. And then we have something called HOME, which helps find housing for retired musicians who have to come off the road either from sickness or who actually get old enough to retire. Um, and so we have that. So, you know, we've built a couple of things in the community. There's actually a number of things in our community that really help that have gone on for a long time now, and they're pretty well-developed organizations. The union here was in receivership, but that's been turned around. HAM, HOME. There's a lot of private goodwill that happens here too. Um, but, you know, now there are no clubs. I don't know about you guys, but I see my friends selling their possessions to make their rent right now. It's a scary time. Well, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, you guys have a great community. Just need a little more organization, maybe. There's plenty of dough there in Kansas City, you know. I felt the same in St. Louis, too. Great town. Boy, what a, boy, what a nest of players there. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, and I know you don't lack for great musicians or great music there. You just now it's hard to get everybody in a room. Yeah, like, you know, the same age, you know, like, uh, you know, people are, there's a lot of organizations getting a lot of, like, private funding and all kinds of stuff like that, but, you know, it's, I, I really wish that we could work together, and my mission is to figure out how to work with people that you just don't necessarily get along with, or, like, yes. you know, it's, like, how can we bridge those gaps and work together and, like, you know, and, and not, not so much be the power player, 
but be more like a friend. The straw that stirs the drink. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, you got some good sayings. <laughs> that's, cool. that's why I write songs. That's what well, that makes me a songwriter. But it's true. You want to be the straw that stirs the drink. And that is, you know, kindness is a learned thing, I always say. And it's a kind of kindness that gets you in with people like that. I live, I'm on the bandstand. I'm like a complete lefty commie. And I'm on the bandstand with some seriously right wing types over the years here. I have some like biker musician friends. They're, they're just like fascists. Oh my God. When I talk politics with them. But we managed to come together on the bandstand because we love music and we love the music we play. And if we can do that and have civilized, Jesus, one of my friends here, he lives uh, outside of Houston. He is as right wing as all get out. His kids are fully militarized. And he's like, I think he's still a Trump supporter. I haven't had that discussion with him lately. But he's one of my favorite people on the planet to play music with. I just love drinking beer and playing music with him. Well, it's also, just... you know, with, with the, you know, with the racial divide right now, Kansas City was a, was a huge epicenter of gospel music uh, and uh, yeah. like blues and, you know, jazz coming from New Orleans and all that stuff. But it's like, we still have s some powerful music here in the community. And, but we have these really strong, uh, just, you know, it, I, 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 you know, I don't want to like beat a dead horse, but it's just, you know, we have really strong musical communities here that could really thrive from just a little bit of communication with each other and, and maybe a little bleed over from, from this event to that event, maybe a, you know, a folk, a folk group that is working on, uh, you know, an event, maybe they pull in a gospel group or maybe they pull in, you know, a children's orchestra to perform. Oh, yeah. Well, what about, I notice here, there isn't really a person of color today among us, except me, I guess. I'm the only one. Is that right? So um, that's a thing, you know. Um, I played gospel music with a quartet style gospel group for about five years. And, um, you know, that thrust me in a community that I did not come from here, especially in Texas. Yeah. And um Boy, what a great experience. Well, how much did I learn musically and socially? And, um, you know, those people are part of my world now and I'm part of theirs. And we built a bridge that was just, you know, still to this day, I'm pretty unshakable as friends and community members. And, and you say, so, yeah, you got to get those people at the table. You know, there's yep. probably a reggae scene in Kansas City. There's probably a gospel scene. I know I was in quartet gospel, not big, the big kind, but I bet there's quartet singers. Oh yeah, there are these brothers. What are their names? They tour. They're from Kansas City. Wilson starts with a W. Ruffin Brothers. <laughs> what is it? Well, there was a group called the Ruffin Brothers. They they have been they have been long since gone, but there's a you lot know, of. It's a touring act now. I believe. Oh, right now. The, 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 the yeah. McFadden. I have, McFad. have the same interests as you McFad. guys. Now, the hip hop community, because what happens to music and hip hop, the music business is actually quite different than the kind of music we're talking about. And there's considerations you have to make in that world in terms of the IP. But in terms of getting your music heard and building community, though, everybody's in the same boat. As Martin Luther King said, I love this one. We came by different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. That's so cool. You're yeah. inspiring. I love these quotes. <laughs> that was painted on the side of a great barbecue joint that is now closed. <laughs> Another wow. casualty to Austin where this guy's barbecue joint, the real estate became worth so much money that you know, yeah. he just had to do it. So, yeah, there's a lot of that happening too. Yeah, and none of that's good for the musicians. We all know that. <laughs> What other questions you guys got? Yeah, we're we're coming up on the uh, on the hour here. So if anyone else has any uh, questions, please step up now. Um, please read those materials I sent. I think you should find them professionally helpful. And um, read the books. Get Kraz's book, the Randy Poe book, in the two page letter. Although it's a little outdated, is a lovely book and it's an easy read. Um, you know, a songwriter's guide to music publishing. It's been out a long time, but uh, some of the principles there are unshakable. You know, certain aspects. You all see, I wish you all good luck in this. It's a very, very difficult business. And, you know, it's, I don't know, it's hard for all of us, I'm afraid. 
Well, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so My much. Pleasure. I hope to come back to, to Kansas City soon and play with Bo. Boy, we had some fun playing music there. Oh, yeah. It did not suck, did not suck at all. I really, really enjoyed it. I put a, a link to his uh, to George's website in the chat there if you want to go listen to what he's what he does. Strong Sadly, all of his, none of my music is available on the internet. <laughs> I took it all off because I was going to tour in 2020. There is a George Carver music channel on YouTube, but that has like funny things, not my records. So, but you know, so I don't know. I'm out of the record business at the moment. I'm redoing my. Actually, that's another thing. Well, we didn't talk about distribution in detail, but. There's a lot. The next one we can just talk about the record business and not publishing. So, okay, I'm sure we'll have you back. That was fantastic, George. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I guess I got to figure out how to get out of this. Thank you all for having me very much. I hope I thank you. I hope I'm okay thank and you. I didn't make an idiot out of myself or whatever. <laughs> all right. So long, everybody. Bye. Bye.